Hi, folks. Next up on This Week in Law, we've got law professors coming out of our ears. We've got Anne-Marie Bridey, Jonathan Mayer, and David Levine joining me. We're going to talk about hacking Keurig's, cars, and Sony, black phone apps, what's up with the TPP, the Pirate Bay sinks, and cannibalism conspiracies, all next on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. And with for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and if you'd like to help us design our new website, I invite you to visit twit.to slash navtest. We've got eight quick questions we'd like to ask you that will help us make the navigation easier to use. That's twit.to slash navtest. Thanks a lot. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell, episode 285, recorded December 12th, 2014. Rainy Day DRM. This episode of This Week in Law is brought to you by FreshBooks, the simple cloud accounting solution that helps millions of entrepreneurs and small business owners save time billing and get paid faster. Join over 5 million users running their businesses with ease. Try it free at freshbooks.com slash twill. And by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Hi, folks. It's Denise Howell, and you're joining us for This Week in Law. I hope you guys have your pencils sharpened and your thinking caps on. It's exam season, of course, and we have three law professors joining us today uh, just to get you in the festive mood of that season. Uh, Of course, the holidays are upon us as well. Uh, But not much in our rundown today is too holiday-oriented, I'm afraid, Uh, just so you know. Except for the fact that uh, we have some scenarios that I'm hoping, you know, maybe not this term, uh, could give our law professors some fodder for their uh, exams coming in the future. Uh, Without much further ado, let's go ahead and introduce them. Returning to the show is Dave Levine from Elon University, Elon Law in Greenfield, North Carolina. Hello, Dave. Good to see you again, Denise. Pleasure to be back. Good to see you, too. For those of you who might not have caught Dave on the show before, uh, he looks at issues related to intellectual uh, property law and public life. Uh, He's the host of Hearsay Culture on KZSU-FM at Stanford. So Dave and I uh, love each other's shows, and I'm always so glad when Dave can join us on ours. That's right. Anything I can do to support a fellow podcaster, I will do. So thrilled to be here. (laughs) Thank you so much. Uh, also joining us is Anne Marie Bridey. Anne Marie teaches copyright law, cyber law, intellectual property, and contracts at the University of Idaho College of Law, uh, it, way, way up near the Canadian border in Idaho. Hi, Anne Marie. Hi, Denise. How are you? I'm great. It's wonderful to have you on the show. Yes, I am here north of everything. <laughs> north of everything, but you say it's not snowing up there. It is not. It's about 55 degrees and cloudy, so we are having a mild winter so far. All right. Well, I hope that uh, that's what you're in the mood for. (laughs) I know uh, here in California, at least uh, I think both Northern and Southern California have been pounded with rain the last couple of days. Um, So we're... uh, I would be upset if I were a downhill skier, but I think I'm fine. That's good. Uh, Also joining us from Northern California is Jonathan Mayer. Hello, Jonathan. Hi there. Jonathan uh, also teaches at Stanford this time. Uh, He's a computer scientist and a lawyer at Stanford. He's a cybersecurity expert. And right now you're teaching surveillance law? That's right. Uh, It's available on Coursera. Uh, Just wrapped up, but we're going to be offering it again. Oh, that is so cool. Um, For people who haven't heard of that, uh, tell them what Coursera is. So it's an online platform that lets lots of students take a class at the same time, one of these massive open online uh, classes or in the less artful acronym, uh, a MOOC. Um, Mm -hmm. And so uh, the idea is that the lectures are recorded and then there's an opportunity to ask questions and office hours. Um, So it allows bringing uh, 
quality educational material to a lot of people at once. Is it free? Yeah. That's so cool. And do people get grades and credit for it? Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a, a statement of accomplishment that's available. Uh, there's CLE credit available. Uh, and uh, I believe we had a little over 18,000 signups this go round. So pretty popular. Wow, that's really quite a lot of people. Um, well, good. We get tons and tons of questions during the show about law and surveillance. So um, I hope that people will go and check that out. Uh, let's start out looking at some policy issues. When Dave comes on the show, we always have to check in with the TPP because Dave is uh, someone who is following that pretty closely. Um, that's the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Dave, why don't you give us the latest? Sure. Thanks, Denise. So, yeah, uh, you know, I've, the last few times that I've come on, uh, there seems to be a broken record, uh, to use an archaic technology reference, uh, refrain that uh, goes on and on, which is, uh, what do we know, but more specifically, what don't we know? Uh, for those uh, in your audience who aren't familiar, the trans Partnership Agreement is a multilateral agreement that uh, involves not just trade issues, but a variety of other topics, including uh, of particular interest to uh, listeners and viewers uh, to This Week in Law, uh, internet policy and intellectual uh, property law. Um, it's a uh, trade agreement designed to do all the things that we think trade agreements are designed to do, create innovation, bring jobs, increase commerce, and so forth. Um, but uh, unlike many other agreements uh, that have been negotiated in the past and involve these issues, uh, it, particularly on the IP and internet side, uh, has been negotiated uh, in stark secrecy. Um, as of today, uh, and again, you know, re recording towards the end of 2014 after uh, 19 plus rounds of negotiation, uh, ministerial meetings and so forth, uh, we have still yet to see uh, a final or even any uh, formal negotiating text coming out of the negotiations. Uh, what that has meant, and particularly given uh, recent uh, recent statements, not just by the president, uh, by, but by ministers in other countries, that uh, the TPP is really at its final stage. Um, and in fact, the president's uh, now involved apparently uh, in in working out, at least from a diplomatic perspective, uh, whatever the details are uh, that are being negotiated. Uh, the public still doesn't know uh, what that agreement will look like. Um, and so even though this agreement is uh, apparently uh, close to finalization at the negotiation level, uh, and even though that would therefore mean that many of the controversial issues, uh, perhaps all of the controversial issues on the IP side, ranging from uh, infringement rules that exist uh, in linking to content on the internet to access to medicine from a patent perspective may have been resolved, uh, the public still is unable to see what's being negotiated uh, and therefore uh, is unable to verify that these terms would or would not change U.S. law and other laws, uh, but also offer input. Uh, so uh, the, the funny thing is, is that, is that the update is largely more of the same uh, in that the secrecy still exists. Uh, there was, however, and a big change uh, since the last time I was on, uh, WikiLeaks did uh, leak another chapter uh, of the IP section of the agreement uh, at this point, uh, you know, six weeks ago or so ago, which which did again offer more information uh, with regard to where the negotiators were. The document itself, however, even though it was, even though it was leaked six weeks ago, uh, was dated uh, from May of 2014, and therefore, as as is generally a problem whenever you're dealing with uh, fast moving negotiations, it's unclear that that document reflects not only where the negotiators were when. It was leaked, much less where they are now. Uh, so there is more information, uh, but unofficial leaks are just that. You don't know uh, whether they are uh, in fact accurate and they don't necessarily reflect where the negotiators are. So at this late date, it would seem like this would be uh, past the time uh, when it would benefit uh, not only the U.S. Trade Representative, but the other negotiators to put a document out there. Um, but nonetheless, we remain uh, largely uh, in the dark. Uh, do you... From the things that have been leaked, Dave, are, are you? I know you just uh, put a big disclaimer on that and said we can't really um, take any of this as gospel. 
Uh, but are there things in there that give you pause? Yeah, you know, if you, when you go through the agreement, uh, there's a there's a lot of language. For example, and again, you know, referencing specifically the kinds of issues that uh, you focus on on this week in law. You know, there's a lot of discussion of you know what we you know proverbially or generally think of as balance uh, inside copyright law. So there is language uh, that suggests that the negotiators, and to be clear, the parties that would eventually uh, have to comply with the agreement, recognize the need for balance uh, in copyright. Uh, uh, law across the board. So even though the prima facie case of copyright infringement would look the same, they recognize a need uh, for for some kind of fair use type uh, protections. Uh, having said that, you know the language of the agreements don't make it clear exactly what those would look like. And of course, you have to remember that when you're dealing with an international trade agreement, uh, which is not the traditional uh, model through which such laws are written, uh, it's unclear what countries would have to do with that information and with those agreements uh, once they have to comply. Uh, there is very robust language uh, that allows for a variety of not only ways to go after alleged copyright infringers, but also remedies, uh, which raise concerns. And even on the trade secret side of the equation, which is an area which doesn't get a lot of attention, uh, there is language suggesting that there would be, for example, criminal sanctions associated potentially with trade secret law in these countries uh, that we don't really have uh, to date, uh, even here in the United States. So again, you know, I always put the dis this disclaimer on, as you noted, Denise, that we really don't know. Uh, but there is definitely cause for concern. On the other hand, uh, it is also fair to say that at least based upon that leak versus the previous chapter leak and the last full chapter leak had occurred at this point, uh, wow, I mean, as I think about it now, almost four years ago, there seemed to be uh, more granularity uh, in the thinking about these issues. Uh, but I am, you know, I'm one of these people and I'm, and, and to be clear, it's not that I don't think that discretion is needed in negotiating agreements. Um, but because we don't have accurate information, um, I guess I become a bit of a hardliner when I say that that it's it's almost counterproductive uh, to comment. And I don't mean that we shouldn't talk about it, uh, but to make sure that when we comment on what's going on in these areas, we are clear that we as members of the public who will be impacted by these agreements uh, do not know exactly what's going on. And I find it a bit irksome uh, that many smart people uh, around the globe, uh, not only uh, academics, but but uh, civil society members and others, uh, have to, uh, to be clear, waste their time at some level uh, going through leaked agreements in the interest of trying to offer input, uh, knowing full well uh, that they don't have all the information they need. Uh, so whereas in an early round negotiation, uh, I could see the, the need for uh, more discretion uh, after nearly 20 rounds of negotiation. To me, the benefits of public disclosure outweigh uh, whatever's needed with regard to bargaining uh, at the diplomatic level. So, I, so I've been a little polemical there, but uh, uh, the fact is, is that the agreement uh, still has many troublesome terms, although uh, it appeared to be a little more balanced than what we saw uh, for the previous leak. I have one more question for you before I get everybody else's input on uh, the current state of the TPP. And that question is, Dave, uh, assuming that we see something soon uh, mm -hmm. that, that is the, the final result of negotiations and something is officially released for people to review, what is the process from that point forward? Is there a way for people to um, critique and massage this document before it takes final effect or is this something, uh, you know, I don't know that much about international treaties and how they are implemented and made effective, but it, it seems like something, you know, it's this one in particular has been negotiated so much in secret and then when it's released, it's kind of like their way or the highway. Yeah, so that's a great question, Denise, and it's a tricky one. Um, here's the short answer. Uh, once the agreement, once the negotiators reach, you know, what is known as a final text, um, that final text leaves this this, this administrative level, uh, where, in in my view, input would be most likely to be useful in terms of making substantive changes, and enters the political process and the legislative process that exists uh, in all of the uh, negotiating countries. In our country, uh, it would, and and this is an enormous uh, political battle, which we. Oh, we'll see the moment that the text 
uh, is finalized uh, occur here in the U.S. The question will be whether the agreement is what's known as fast tracked. Um, and what fast track authority is, uh, in a nutshell, is a way for the president uh, to move pretty rapidly with limited ability uh, on, the, on the congressional level uh, to offer uh, amendments and changes and the like uh, towards uh, ultimate ratification. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, interesting, uh, interesting outcomes of the uh, elections from last month uh, is that uh, where we might expect that, that the president uh, and a Republican-controlled uh, Congress uh, would be at loggerheads on everything. Uh, this is actually one area where uh, I would expect that the uh, Republican uh, Senate uh, and the president might actually have more in common than not. Uh, the major uh, proponents of slowing down uh, the agreement once it reaches the Senate, i.e. not fast tracking it and allowing for more public input and, and exactly what you're referring to, more ability to actually make changes has come from the Democratic uh, members of the Senate led uh, by senators like uh, Senator Wyden uh, from Oregon. Um, because uh, the Democrats will not be in control uh, in the next Congress, uh, it would seem that the Republican-led uh, Senate would be much more likely to move this agreement along um, and not have the same kind of uh, back and forth and amendment process uh, that the Democrats might have had. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a surprising, uh, surprising if, if you don't pay attention to these issues. And as you point out, they are, uh, they are rather complex and they're not a traditional realm uh, that intellectual property and technology people uh, tend to focus. Uh, so the short, that's the long answer. The short answer to your question is practically speaking, uh, it is gonna be much more difficult for anyone uh, including senators, uh, to make changes to the text uh, after it leaves the negotiating rounds um, and enters the political process, which is why um, I am I have firmly, and I'm, and I'm writing on this, and I'll have more uh, to say about it next year, um, I'm firmly in the camp of wanting to move this fast because, and I'll leave this as a teaser, and I, I want to hear from Emory and Jonathan as well, um, the uh, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, the TTIP, uh, which is, uh, if you will, a TPP analog being negotiated between between the EU and the United States, uh, which can have many similar uh, provisions and efforts and international harmonization is in the early rounds of negotiation. And the EU has been pushing uh, much more than we saw in the TPP, and remember the EU is not part of the TPP, to have more transparency and more access information. Uh, so this issue involving access information and international trade on the IP and technology level uh, is going to continue uh, to plague us uh, or help us, depending on your perspective, uh, for the next uh, few years at least. All right. Well, that wasn't exactly uh, a holiday fruitcake that I think any of us want to sink our teeth into. No, yes, yes. Happy <laughs> exactly. holidays to everyone. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, Anne-Marie, uh, anything to add to this? No, I mean, I just think this feels like ACTA all over again. And yeah. uh, I know Dave and I were both pretty uh, intimately involved with things that were happening when ACTA was being negotiated. And I feel like ACTA was more transparent relative to what's going on in the TPP. Um, and so I don't know, I, I haven't looked at the full text of the last leak from the TPP, but I definitely share Dave's concerns that we are not really going to have a meaningful opportunity as the public and our, our representatives in Congress are not going to have a meaningful opportunity to weigh in to make any changes to this agreement, that it will be presented as ACTA was as a fait accompli. Um, and it will be interesting to see when the text does get released, whether the same kind of firestorm that grew up around ACTA uh, will also uh, coalesce around this, I'm just not sure. But one of the things that was interesting to me about the TTIP agreement was uh, the pressure that was coming already from the EU negotiators to be more public and more transparent uh, about the process. And I think that would be a beneficial, that would be a beneficial thing. I think the United States has been really one of the most secretive of all of the negotiating parties for all of these agreements. And uh, you know, there's for for a country that is supposedly dedicated to transparency and democratic process. It's just a it's just a distressing uh, it's a distressing truth about the process. Yeah, I agree. Jonathan, uh, any thoughts on this? Uh, <clears throat> so I guess two thoughts. Uh, the first being there's some potential here for 2016 presidential politics to leak in. Uh, it's not clear that's going to happen yet, but. Uh, it's not outside the, the realm of possibility. 
Um, some Republicans have tried to make wedge issues around technology, uh, in particular surrounding NSA revelations. Um, that could happen here. Uh, I believe Rand Paul's on the record saying he wanted TPP to advance. So there's one leading voice that probably uh, doesn't seem likely to, to chime in, but it's possible. Uh, so that's one thought. Uh, the other being there's a strange political dynamic around TPP where uh, uh, many of the provisions are intended to align uh, law in other nations with American law uh, and of particular concern, of course, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, and so uh, the the political dynamic in the U.S. is less one of um, uh, making the law worse so much as entrenching the law. Uh, and that could potentially uh, cut in favor of um, lesser response or it could potentially cut in favor of, um, well, what's the big deal? What's the rush to to um, to enact? I guess my my knee jerk reaction would be if if there aren't particular harmful legal provisions that uh, uh, opponents are going to be able to point to saying, you know, here's how things get worse under TPP, as opposed to, well, other countries are going to do these bad things that we've already done in our own law. Um, that's going to make opposition difficult. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and make entrenching the law our first MCLE passphrase for this episode of This Week in Law. Uh, we put these phrases in the show in case you are listening for continuing legal or other professional education credit. If you're interested in doing that, we have some information about it on our wiki at wiki.twit.tv. If you head on over to the This Week in Law page there, uh, we've got some information for lawyers who are interested in listening to the show for CLE credit. And in some jurisdictions, uh, folks like to know that uh, you have some way of proving that you actually watched or listened. So we put these phrases in the show for that purpose. And our first one is entrenching the law. Uh, Dave, let's talk about uh, the possibility of a federal trade secret law. Uh, what's going on there, and uh, if it happens, what does that mean? Sure. So uh, with regard to this issue, and I guess I should uh, put a disclaimer up front, uh, which is that I've uh, been active in opposing uh, the efforts in Congress to federalize trade secret law. Um, the, the nutshell on this issue uh, is that there there is a legitimate concern among uh, businesses in the United States, large and small. And of course, uh, we know it only too well now with regard to what's happening uh, with Sony at the moment, which we may talk about later. Uh, there's a legitimate and huge concern about uh, cyber espionage, right? The ability of uh, intruders and hackers and the like uh, to break into corporate networks uh, to steal all kinds of information. Uh, in the case of Sony, of course, it's, it's information, not just IP, uh, but a range of other things. But a lot of what happens happens tends to be uh, the theft. It's information that's valuable uh, because it is not known by competitors. Uh, what has happened uh, with, with, in, with increasing frequency, although it's hard to uh, quantify it, uh, has been not just intruders breaking into uh, corporate networks uh, through on their own, uh, but state-backed uh, cyber espionage uh, and intrusions uh, coming uh, apparently and largely from uh, China uh, and, to a, and to a lesser extent countries like Russia. Um, and what that's meant uh, has been that uh, U.S. industry has has been looking for ways uh, to address uh, these intrusions. Uh, and they have argued that the existing uh, state uh, federal uh, state, excuse me, state trade secret law, uh, which primarily comes out of the Uniform Trade Secret Act, is inadequate. Uh, and so, in an effort to uh, to address these concerns, uh, members of Congress, and on a bipartisan uh, basis, uh, introduced bills, uh, really starting a couple of years ago, uh, but most recently in the last Congress, uh, designed to create a federal private cause of action under uh, an act called the Electronic Espionage Act, uh, which is uh, an act that is used at the federal level to allow the Department of Justice and others to bring uh, criminal prosecution against uh, intruders uh, into networks who attempted to steal trade secrets. Uh, the bills that currently exist, uh, known as the Trade Secret Protection Act uh, and the Defend Trade Secrets Act, uh, respectively, at least in the last Congress, uh, and I have no doubt that they will be introduced early uh, in the new Congress, 
uh, are designed to give the this this new private cause of action uh, to industry, along with powers like ex parte seizure, uh, which is an issue which, as Amory mentioned, ACTA uh, is always a concern whenever you're dealing with uh, IP enforcement. The question of being able to uh, seize assets of a, a putative defendant uh, often without notice and without the defendant's ability uh, to uh, defend itself. Um, and in the federal uh, bills that are currently uh, being considered, uh, an ex parte seizure provision would allow, with, with some limitation, uh, for a, a private plaintiff to uh, use a criminal process to seize a wide uh, swath of uh, information uh, that might be uh, connected with the alleged trade secret misappropriation. Um, the bills themselves uh, have, have wide support from groups like the National Association of Manufacturers uh, and others. Uh, however, uh, through through work that I have done with uh, Sharon Sandine from uh, Hamlin Law, uh, she and I and, and many other uh, IP professors uh, raised some significant concerns about the bills. Uh, first and foremost being that the bills don't, in our view, actually do anything to address the problems uh, that the sponsor of the bills um, are identifying. Uh, there's, there's, we, we do not believe, and I, I could say we certainly based upon this letter. And uh, Denise, I can send you a link to it if you want to put it up uh, on sure. your site after the show. Uh, but the nutshell is, uh, Sharon and I uh, and others who signed the letter don't see the bill as doing anything to specifically address cyber espionage. Um, and it's unclear to us exactly what the specific factual scenario is uh, that the uh, supporters of the bills. Uh, think they're going after. Uh, relevant to the work that Jonathan does, the, as best as we can tell, the uh, hypothetical, and it's not a hypothetical, it happens, uh, that they're most concerned about uh, would be an employee uh, who puts a thumb drive into a computer, uh, puts trade secrets on the thumb drive, and then heads to a U.S. international airport like O'Hare and is about to get on a plane to a foreign country. Uh, what does that company do to intercept that fleeing employee and prevent them from leaving the country uh, with the trade secrets? Uh, the fact is, as we see the bills, the bills do nothing to make it any, any easier for a company to go after those people. So that's one issue. There are others, and as you know, as as you know, with law professors generally, we can go on and on and on. Um, but there are other issues we have, uh, ranging from the fact that these bills say nothing about things like covenants not to compete and mobility of labor and access to information, which is another huge issue. So it could actually be used as another way for uh, corporate entities to control access to intellectual property information that the public might want access to um, and other concerns that we have. Uh, its status, uh, to be clear, is because it has bipartisan support. Uh, for example, it was sponsored in the Senate by Senators Leahy uh, and Coons uh, and also uh, other senators on, on the Republican side, uh, as well as in the House uh, where you have uh, the bill being sponsored by, for example, by, by my retiring uh, member of Congress, Howard Coble, who's a Republican from North Carolina, uh, and Jerry Nadler, a Democrat uh, in New York, uh, who are not generally people working together on high profile legislation. Uh, this looks like, just as TPP does, looks like another piece of legislation which might be in this group of bills that could move uh, fast and, and wind up on the president's desk. Uh, the White House has identified trade secret misappropriation uh, and direct intrusions into, into our you know, major uh, defense oriented companies like Boeing um, over the last couple of years. And so the White House uh, it, it appears to be in support of doing something like this. Um, and so, you know, Sharon and I, along with the support of some of our colleagues, uh, have been attempting to raise these concerns. Our hope uh, is that there will be public hearings on the bills, because as it stands now, the only hearings that have been on the bills have focused on the harms, have focused on the question of is there cyber espionage? And that's not really debated. The issue that Congress has to grapple with is whether these particular bills address those problems and whether there aren't downsides that outweigh whatever punitive de benefits we, th we think there are. Uh, Sharon and I think that there's clearly far more downsides than there are any benefits. And so we hope that there will be hearings. Um, I expect the bills to be reintroduced rather quickly 
in the next Congress. And I would suspect that you'll be hearing a lot more about these bills uh, in the early part of next year. Jonathan, we've, we've all seen the results of laws that uh, get enacted that are possibly not well designed to achieve uh, their goal and possibly broader than they need to be. I'm thinking of, for example, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, um, where it can be applied in ways that maybe the lawmakers never even intended. Um, do, you, do you think that this federal trade secret proposed legislation um, sounds like it's falling in the same category or, or is there something useful here? Uh, it's certainly a great risk. So in uh, debates over uh, uh, computer access statutes or trade secret statutes, uh, there's this focus, as David noted, on these big, sophisticated foreign actors that are just uh, you know, pillaging everything uh, from American companies. Uh, and I think uh, while it makes sense to focus on those issues as a policy concern, there's a mismatch between those episodes and what trade secret or computer access statutes can actually achieve. Uh, realistically, uh, these sophisticated foreign actors are just outside the reach of the American legal system. Um, kind of a, a pointed example of that being this indictment, uh, uh, what, past few months, half a year ago, something like that, of some Chinese officers uh, who were involved in breaches in the United States. Th those folks are certainly never going to be prosecuted in the, in, in the U.S. court. Um, and so uh, kind of in, in the dynamics of uh, legislation surrounding computer access, trade secret, it's important to keep in mind uh, who's actually going to be uh, who's actually going to be a realistic defendant here. Um, and so to the extent that there's uh, some good cases you want plaintiffs to be able to bring, prosecutors to be able to bring, uh, some cases that are of great concern, um, it's important to bear in mind the factual background that for uh, many of these statutes will tilt the, the kind of practical litigation towards the more concerning cases. All right. Anne-Marie, anything to add here? Not much. I mean, I think uh, the point that Dave made about the ex parte seizure provisions being problematic is potentially a way for competitors to harass uh, other competitors. That's a problem. And uh, Jonathan's jurisdictional point, I think, is probably the most important one. So to the extent that these uh, these hacks and cyber attacks are coming from outside the United States, I'm not quite sure how you know, the ability to bring a claim in, in U.S. federal courts is going to be able to reach Ukrainian or Chinese um, you know, uh, hackers. So I just, I'm not sure that the law is going to achieve its intended goal to the extent that a lot of these attacks are originating from places abroad. All right, well, hopefully, yes, point? Dave. Yeah, yeah, very, very quickly. Yeah, on yes. both, both of those points are, are excellent. You know, recognize that one of the big issues here uh, is that trade secrecy uh, is generally off the radar, uh, not only uh, among the public, but even among civil society. Um, and so there, there is an increasing number, uh, but, it's, but it's slow, uh, of, of civil society groups and members and others who are starting to pay attention to trade secrecy. Uh, public citizen uh, has, has begun to take a look here. And the reason why I wanted to jump in is because both of these points uh, that Jonathan and Anne-Marie made are exactly right. Uh, there, it is it, it is not at all clear, and I, in fact, we don't think it's the case that there would be any uh, extra uh, any ability for a company to enforce these orders outside, and they certainly can't reach jurisdictionally. One of the arguments that's been made in favor of the bills, uh, coincidentally and, and ironically, uh, is that U.S. trade secret law is difficult to explain to people who live in other countries. Um, and literally one of the arguments has been that if there is a federal law that is uniform across all the states, it will be easier for the United States to explain trade secret law. And exactly to Jonathan's point with regard to international trade earlier, make it easier for the US to therefore perhaps have these countries model US law. Um, I, I find that almost laughable, um, because particularly since the UTSA has been adopted in most states. But what, what I wanted to jump in on and say quite clearly is that there's an opportunity here for the public to not only educate itself, but also to learn more about this area 
area um, and have an impact. Uh, because one thing I've noticed is that there is a need uh, for understanding about trade secret law in particular because it doesn't get the attention that copyright patents and trademark does and really doesn't even get the attention, attention that things like privacy does. And so I throw that out there. Info Justice, which is American University's uh, PIDGET program uh, at infojustice.org, does a lot of good work here. Of course, EFF writes about it and there are other groups. Uh, but I wanted to jump in and just point out that this is an area which is wildly underexplored and needs a lot more attention than it's been getting. All right. And I'm going to just point out for um, anyone who is not a lawyer that the uh, Uniform Trade Secrets Act is what UTSA stands for. Um, and what that means, the fact that it's been adopted in, did you say all the states, Dave? No, it's been, it's, it's, at this point, it's basically uh, 47 states and the District of Columbia, uh, Massachusetts may be adopting it soon. So pretty close to all the states. Pretty and that close, means yeah. that, that although the states may have different variations in how they um, enforce trade secret law, they, they have this one unifying document that almost all of them have signed on to. And uh, also for anyone who, like me, I'm always glad, uh, Dave, when we do our shows that I'm in front of a computer and can Google things if necessary. I did not know, and I'm going to public service for anyone else who didn't, that civil society, according to Wikipedia, is the aggregate of non-governmental organizations and institutions that manifest interests and will of citizens. So things like EFF and uh, EPIC, and uh, am I on the right track there? So that, that's exactly right. It's, it's yes. groups okay. that... that to speak for large uh, public interests. Gotcha. Sorry for using all that jargon. Uh, this is the lawyer in me. You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Uh, let's see, where should we go next? I think uh, what we will do is take a quick break. We're going to get to some privacy considerations in just a moment here. But first, we're going to thank our sponsor, our first sponsor for this episode of This Week in Law, and that is FreshBooks, the cloud accounting software designed from the ground up for entrepreneurs and small businesses. Now, I know how great it works for a small business because that's what I have. I'm a solo attorney, and I've been using FreshBooks in my practice for quite some time. It manages invoices seamlessly, just stays in the background, does exactly what you want it to do, uh, is non-intrusive and just professional and great. If you're still using Word or Excel or Google Docs to create invoices, you really have to give it a try because FreshBooks is the easiest way to create professional looking invoices in minutes. FreshBooks is built for a growing business. On average, FreshBooks customers double their revenue in the first 24 months and get paid an average of five days faster. Are you tracking billable hours with a watch still? Billing clients for your time has never been easier. All you have to do if you're using FreshBooks is open the app on your phone, start the timer, and go. You can also avoid those awkward emails and phone calls to your late paying clients. Automated late payment reminders help you get paid faster and stay worry free. You can also set up recurring profiles so you can put out your billing easily and seamlessly. It's like it's on autopilot. FreshBooks customers spend less time on paperwork, freeing up to two days a month to focus on the work that they love. Do you keep your receipts in a shoebox? I used to do that, but I don't have to anymore because what I can do with FreshBooks is just snap photos of receipts right from my phone and instantly capture my expenses. You can also instantly access complete financial reports so you can make smart decisions for your business. FreshBooks integrates with your apps, Google Apps, PayPal, Stripe, MailChimp, Fundbox, Zen Payroll. And if you ever need help, you'll talk to a real person every time and support is free forever. Try FreshBooks free for 30 days with no obligation. Go to freshbooks.com slash twill and enter this week in law in the how did you hear about us section when signing up. Start your 30 day free trial today. Go to freshbooks.com slash twill and don't forget to enter this week in law when they ask you how you heard about us. Thank you so much FreshBooks for supporting this episode of this week in law. All right, as promised, let's talk privacy. All right, Jonathan, I guess this, we are uh, more solidly in uh, your wheelhouse here. Uh, can you tell us about what happened uh, just this week or last week, correct, that um, extended the NSA's metadata collection authority? Uh, so periodically, the NSA, uh, through the FBI, 
uh, has to go back to the FISA court and get permission to continue the bulk domestic phone metadata program. That's the program that's been really controversial. There's been a lot of media coverage. There's been a lot of uh, legislative debate around it. Um, and so uh, there was another of these <clears throat> renewals recently. Uh, and uh, the kind of upcoming key debate is that the provision under which this program has been operated, Section 215 of the USA Patriot Act, is scheduled to expire in mid-2015. Uh, and so these renewals can continue to be a, a form matter until then. Uh, but after uh, mid-2015, there's uh, some debate over whether the NSA could continue this program um, under that legal authority or under other legal authorities. All right. So uh, it, there's just really nothing to be done about this. The lawmakers have spoken and uh, the NSA is going to go forward unless one of these constitutional challenges uh, to the laws that we have in place right now uh, becomes successful. Am I right about that, Jonathan? Well, there could also be a statutory challenge to the law. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, the, the constitutional challenge is that a collection of metadata in this in this quantity over this period of time uh, is is constitutionally uh, invalid in a way that uh, collecting one person's metadata in some targeted fashion isn't. Uh, there's very clear Supreme Court precedent, uh, Smith against Maryland, that uh, phone metadata isn't protected by the Constitution. Uh, the Supreme Court may come back and revisit that. Uh, I certainly hope, uh, sure hope it will. Um, but until then, courts are going to have to navigate around it. Uh, and, and they've been somewhat skeptical of the notion that there's something unique about bulk or long-term metadata. Uh, the statutory challenge just says, look, the, the Section 215 of the Patriot Act just doesn't authorize this program. Um, and uh, challenges to that are brought under the Administrative Procedure Act. Uh, I think as a, as a purely legal matter, the statutory challenge is, is the stronger one. Um, the issue is showing that the Administrative Procedure Act isn't precluded by some other provisions around uh, Section 215 challenges. Um, so there's this notion that only someone who receives one of these orders can challenge it, uh, not folks who happen to learn about one of these orders and are impacted by it. Um, if I were judge for a day, I would dispose of the issue on the, the statutory ground. But uh, thus far, courts have, uh, courts have found they can't reach the statutory issue. All right. Well, we will continue seeing if somebody, some judge decides to take that on. Uh, many judges are being asked to consider these practices on constitutional grounds. Uh, and I guess we just had, was it, um, I know this case is pending in the Ninth Circuit. Anne Maria, was it oral argument that just happened in uh, Smith versus Obama? Yes, oral argument in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, and, you know, two cases have already been decided on this issue of uh, the constitutionality of Section 215. There was one in the District of the District of Columbia, Clayman versus Obama. Uh, and the court there actually, I'm a little bit more sanguine maybe than Jonathan is about this. The court uh, did think that there was something about the bulk metadata telephony or bulk telephony metadata collection uh, that's going on now that is different from uh, what was going on in Smith versus Maryland, that, that, that quantitatively the difference is so profound that for constitutional purposes it actually amounts to a qualitative uh, difference. Um, but, you know, then there was a court in New York uh, in a case called ACLU versus Clapper that found that there was no Fourth Amendment violation. And so I think it seems like this issue is headed for the Supreme Court. I think one of the litigants in either the District of the District of Columbia or the Southern District of New York tried to get it to go to sort of bypass the circuit courts of appeals and go directly to the Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court said, no, this case just needs to make its way up to us like any other case does. But, you know, I'll also say that the White House Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board is on the record as saying that Section 215 does not provide an adequate legal basis for uh, the bulk metadata uh, collection. And so, uh, it would be great if there were a statutory amendment that would uh, sort of discontinue this practice. Um, I think that might be the cleanest way to do it, uh, given, as Jonathan said, the sort of uh, iffiness of the constitutional challenges. We've already seen two courts go two different ways uh, on this question. But um, it was just interesting to me that the, that the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board has said you know, there is no legal basis for this. Too much, too much data is being collected about too many people and it's being retained for too long a time. 
Right, and it's kind of interesting to look at the um, the parties involved in uh, this case that was just argued before the Ninth Circuit. And just as an aside, if we're looking for this case to go up to the Supreme Court, I guess maybe we can be happy that there's one of these constitutional challenges pending in the Ninth Circuit because the Supreme Court so loves to undo what the Ninth Circuit has done. <laughs> so maybe they'll get their opportunity to um, engage in one of their favorite pastimes with this case. Uh, but Anna Smith seems quite fascinating. She's um, uh, she's described herself as a northern Idaho mom with no particular legal background, and uh, her husband argued the appeal. He's a lawyer, but but not uh, um, you know a lawyer who deals with these kinds of constitutional issues on a regular basis. But uh, he's getting some help from the ACLU and EFF, uh, who have their own lawsuits pending. Uh, any any Idaho insights about Anna Smith, Anne Marie? No, not in particular. I mean, I think she's an interesting plaintiff just because she just seems so much like an every woman. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she's she is not the ACLU. Um, mm -hmm. we, one of the interesting aspects of this case is that, you know, uh, other plaintiffs in these kinds of cases have had trouble in the past establishing standing because they weren't able to prove that their data was actually being collected. Uh, and I think, um, you know, uh, the Snowden leaks really did provide a basis, you know, for uh, for ordinary citizens to bring these kinds of claims because what they established was basically, well, every single Verizon customer is having their metadata collected. And so whereas before plaintiffs would have difficulty establishing standing because they couldn't prove that their data was being collected. And of course, you know, that was a secret what data was being collected. So they couldn't get at it, you know, by subpoena or uh, any other way. And so I think the Snowden leaks have really opened up this field of litigation to ordinary people like uh, like Anna Smith. Dave, any thoughts about constitutional challenges to data collection or statutory interpretation challenges? Yeah, I mean the the, the only the only broad comment I have, and is what what Emery was just alluding to, is that you know the, the Snowden leaks themselves. Uh, you know, have brought all kinds of technological concepts um, and methods uh, to public light that uh, it, even if people attempted to understand them, uh, they would be challenged and they weren't aware anyway that these concepts really applied to them. Uh, so I do, I, I share Emery's, you know, interest and fascination that you could have uh, you know, two people uh, who are appear to be uh, entirely outside uh, the a group of you know likely plaintiffs uh, for this kind of suit to have the ability to uh, go to you know one of the main uh, federal appellate courts that would be handling these issues uh, and have their case heard. And the the article that you shared you know indicated that uh, Ms. Smith said uh, how how amazing it was that she felt like she had the ability to do it. You know, I one one thing that I certainly hope for, and anyone that's been around cyber law for a long time knows this. Uh, it, it, one of the potential benefits of the Snowden leaks, uh, aside from the ability to uh, simply know what's going on, is that perhaps it will force uh, policymakers and decision makers to have a more granular understanding of technology. Uh, and, you know, certainly while we would have you know, confidence generally in, in judges uh, doing their best to understand the technology. Uh, recent experience with, you know, uh, bills like SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act a few years ago, uh, and others indicate that there's still an enormous knowledge gap. Uh, and so perhaps, you know, again, this is optimistic, uh, mm. the stunt leaks can allow uh, for better understanding of, of what exactly we're doing with technology, which can lead to uh, ameliorating a lot of the harms that uh, have existed because of lack of information. Hopefully they'll decide to take Jonathan up on his Coursera offerings and become, it's, you know, part of the 18,000 <laughs> and try yeah, he, to he makes better understand. Student, so. <laughs> yes. Um, we've been referring to Joe Mullen's article coverage of this case over at Ars Technica, and you can do that too. You can look at his piece and all the rest of the things that we have in our rundown. They're available at delicious.com slash thisweekinlaw slash 285 is our episode number this time around. Uh, Jonathan, tell me what the All Writs Act is and why it's been in the news lately. Uh, sure. So the All Writs Act is uh, an old statute that lets courts issue, well, court orders. Uh, it's sort of a Swiss army knife. It gets used for all sorts of things, ranging from uh, appellate review um, to, um, uh, to certain types of uh, challenging agency action to 
uh, most recently and quite controversially, uh, assisting and effectuating warrants. And in particular, uh, the uh, Department of Justice has been getting warrants uh, for um, uh, for locked iPhones and Android devices, uh, and then um, uh, getting assistance from Apple and Google in unlocking those devices. Uh, th this is kind of a strange news story in that for folks who were watching surveillance law, this was all known. Um, in fact, the, the language that some uh, journalists pointed to as concerning surrounding the All Writs Act was language out of Apple's own law enforcement guide. Uh, so, uh, so the so the notion that the All Writs Act was getting used in this way was was not really news, um, but it was I think uh, a, a news I should say within the surveillance law community. Uh, but it was surprising to a lot of people who weren't steeped in surveillance law, uh, and uh, and so um, there are some potentially uh, quite concerning applications of the All Writs Act. Don't seem to it doesn't seem to have been used in these ways yet. But just to, to give a couple hypotheticals, uh, what if a company were uh, compelled to uh, ship a backdoored software update, or we're compelled to decrypt a phone, not just get rid of the lock screen, but actually do decrypt the contents. Um, uh, DOJ could try it. Uh, it's not clear how a court would rule, um, but uh, uh, but very clearly the All Writs Act is the law on point. Uh, does it give anyone pause that this authority is flowing from an act that came into being in 1789? Uh, I have to say, I don't really find that argument so uh, so compelling. I think it's funny. I think it's really funny. Um, <laughs> it is kind but, of funny. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, folks are going to object to these searches based on a constitutional amendment from from, from the 18th century. They're uh, going to have these arguments in courts with their jurisdiction dating back to the, the 18th century. So the notion that it's old and therefore it's somehow questionable, I, I don't think carries a lot of water in our profession. Uh, maybe in the technology profession, that's a good argument. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Dave, any thoughts about this? Yeah, well, you know, I was going to, I, I I think I agree with Jonathan to a degree. Um, he, and I think he, ultimately he's probably right that it, it doesn't matter as much uh, that the act is old as 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 much as it might matter uh, that the act reflects uh, what behaviors and technologies and, and activities that uh, do not indicate where we are today you know as I, as I was listening to Jonathan talk and 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 just you know following the issue and I don't follow it closely um, but it reminds me of, of what was going on uh, in the early days of the internet if we can flash back to uh, you know the late 90s and early 2000s with online gaming um, and the question of whether uh, one could gamble online uh, mm -hmm. And as and when, this was when I was in practice, but I did some work for software manufacturers then who were wondering whether uh, what they were creating, that is gambling software, uh, would violate U.S. law. And it turned out, and we now, the issues have largely been resolved, uh, but at the time, uh, people started getting into the Wire Act, which of course is, is, an, is an act from a federal law from the early parts of, uh, of communication technology uh, involving the question of whether information was moving over wires and what have you. Uh, and it was a problematic issue. Now, again, you know, as Jonathan pointed out, you can get to answers and you can apply these laws. Uh, but the fact that you're dealing with an older law certainly uh, for me, uh, it causes me to think more carefully about the policies underlying them uh, and whether those laws are the right fit for the behaviors that we have today. So that was just that's just kind of a broader observation about the role of law uh, here. But I generally agree with Jonathan that that doesn't necessarily mean that the law shouldn't apply or doesn't apply uh, to these situations. Well, and I think we just have to make our second MCLE passphrase for the show party like it's 1789. So uh, there you go. Both phrases are in the show for folks who are listening for continuing legal education purposes. Uh, Anne-Marie, uh, any pause on your part, uh, having authority flow from something that is either too old or too ill-fitting to um, serve the purposes that it's being used for today? Well, I will not be the only cyber law prof to not have a cyber law chestnut. Uh, and so my chestnut <laughs> is... Uh, the early cases involving spam and intrusions to corporate computer networks were pursued under a theory called trespass to chattels, which was another ah, one yes. of these really, really old theories. And so I guess I don't have a problem with the idea that you would adapt old law to new scenarios and new technologies. I think that's how the law uh, evolves. Um, 
But I, I, you know, but I do think that uh, that, you know, the FBI and law enforcement will sort of stop at nothing uh, to try to undermine these efforts by manufacturers to sort of disempower themselves from being able to provide information about their users. And it seems to me that that's what Apple and Google are doing by sort of encrypting uh, operating systems as they would like to take themselves out of the middle uh, of these kinds of uh, investigations and the All Writs Act is being used to not let them do that. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know what to say about that, but the, you know, old old wine, new bottles, old law, new technology, I don't think that's a problem. I think that's just the way the law works and how it uh, how it relates to developing technology. Let's talk about old phones and new phones and the business model behind black phone and whether uh, under that business model, um, black phone may just skirt these kinds of issues because there's nothing technologically it can do to help law enforcement. Um, black phone for folks who haven't been following it very clearly is, is a phone that is um, oriented around the user's privacy and uh, is all about end-to-end -end encryption and, and basically um, serving the market niche that is growing up around people who are concerned about the government being able to access their email accounts, their phones, et cetera, et cetera. So um, Blackphone recently announced that not only is it going to have its phone, which in and of itself is an interesting development, but it's going to have its own app store uh, populated with privacy-oriented apps. Uh, Jonathan, what do you think about this? Well, there's clearly a, a growing market demand for privacy-oriented products and services. Um, uh, so far as the, the law goes, um, there uh, isn't uh, a requirement that a company put a backdoor in its products uh, of this sort with one asterisk for uh, voice over IP that oh, yeah. al uh, allows for calls to the ordinary phone system that's covered by uh, the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act or CALEA. Um, but otherwise there, there, uh, there aren't uh, prospective assistance laws on the books. Uh, and so I, I completely agree with uh, Anne-Marie that I think this is part of a movement to use technology to take companies out of the equation where there's nothing the legal process uh, can can do to them uh, to compel user to compel access to their users' information. Um, mm -hmm. Law enforcement is going to have to go to the users themselves. Right, which is less convenient, but but probably the way it should be done. Uh, do you agree, Dave? Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, you know, that would seem to be. Uh, <laughs> the main way that we'd want, uh, you know, this work to happen. I mean, again, you know, you know, a lot of the themes that run through, uh, you know, the topics we're talking about today involve, you know, these broad questions of notice, uh, terms of service, which we haven't alluded to yet, but might, uh, but just, just questions of what the capabilities are. Uh, and I'm, you know, I have, and this is just more of my own speculation, uh, but when, you know, everything from the Snowden leaks uh, to the kinds of behaviors that that black phone um, and entities that focus on privacy deal with, uh, you know, turn to are questions of people simply not being aware of what's going on. Uh, you know, it, it's a thought experiment that we'll never have. But I, but I've wondered, uh, you know, how much opposition uh, would actually have occurred um, if, in a, a hypothetical world, the public uh, had been told, "Hey, look, right? The NSA is going to pay attention to and read all of your emails." Uh, that's not to suggest that there aren't significant concerns and problems that we might have with that and undermining the purpose of the internet and internet architecture. But a lot of people might also say, well, thanks for telling me, and now I know. And so I think I think Blackphone and these other entities are addressing uh, a real market vacuum that's existed uh, in people just feeling like they're being treated uh, in an upfront way. Yeah, I think it's really fascinating how, you know, we adopt these new technologies because they're convenient or fun or they have lots of utility for us. And the privacy ramifications of them don't really hit home um, until something like the Snowden leaks happen. Um, I'm hoping that Anna Smith is uh, has been reached out to by the Black Phone people and that she's one of their beta testers. There would be some nice synergy to that. Um, but cars are kind of like phones that way. You know, we're all uh, driving around in increasingly technologically sophisticated cars. 
And I think that at some point there will be a similar epiphany that as we are using all these um, useful and uh, convenient and fun features in the cars, that the the privacy ramifications of them will hit home too. And it looks like uh, car makers are starting to pay attention to that as well with 19 automakers um, who make most of the passenger cars and trucks sold in the U.S. signing on to a set of principles they say will protect motorist privacy, motorists' privacy uh, in the modern era. Um, have you looked at this, Jonathan, and do you consider this a positive step? Uh, I, I have looked at it. Um, so this move of an industry uh, that's facing potential privacy concerns um, uh, rallying around a self-regulatory code uh, is is not a new move. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think th the positive spin on it is here's an industry that's trying to do the right thing uh, in advance of potential concerns. I think the more cynical and in many cases more realistic take is here's an industry that doesn't want to get uh, legislated against or regulated against or slapped with lawsuits. Uh, and so they're going to uh, try to get in front of the issue in, in a way. Um, the recurring problem with these codes of conduct is they have loopholes so big you could, I, I'm really trying not to use the pun about like drive a truck through it here, um, <laughs> uh, but, but they have huge loopholes. Uh, this document is no different. Um, there, there are all sorts of provisions around uh, companies being allowed to collect data for, for their own uh, internal purposes, um, just like many other of these codes of conduct. Uh, so uh, I think the question to put to an automaker in the wake of this document um, is uh, tell us the sorts of information you're going to collect uh, or put differently, tell us the sorts of information you could have collected before uh, but won't collect now. Uh, and I, I think th those categories look pretty slim. Uh, so I can't say uh, this document uh, looks overly, um, uh, looks like an overly great privacy protection. Um, but there's no doubt the, the automakers did a good job with the PR spin around it. They look good for it. Uh, it's understandable why they do it. Yeah, it, it, I do. I, I join you in your skepticism that there there's a PR aspect of this, especially because, you know, and I don't pretend to know, you know, all the intricacies of um, new automotive developments. But it seems as we sit here today that instead of your car becoming your phone, it's really how your phone integrates with your car. So if there's going to be a privacy uh, question, it's really one that involves the phone more than the automobile today. Uh, do you agree, Dave? Yeah, you know, it, it's uh, it, this is interesting. Uh, at a, uh, at a, uh, a conference that uh, Princeton's uh, Center for Information Technology Policy, where I'm, where I'm doing a fellowship this year, uh, did uh, last month that Andrea Medwishan did. There was a presentation involving autonomous cars uh, done uh, by uh, Bo Stevens and Raul Rojas. And uh, Raul in particular laid out a schematic of how cars themselves, the, the, the cars that are coming in the next few years really, um, are going to be uh, communicating with each other and where within your automobile uh, you are going to be communicating. Uh, and it was in, incredibly complex and mind boggling. Uh, and in a room full of you know people, and I'm not one of them who follow this, these issues very closely, um, and, and also not one of them who are uh, computer science people, uh, they were amazed. Uh, it reminded me, again, I, I'm, I'm doing these broad scope kind of statements, but uh, it, it, it was got me thinking about all of the issues surrounding copyright duration and how complex it is uh, to figure out uh, whether a particular work of authorship is under copyright protection based upon when it's published because of all of the changes to U.S. copyright law. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I again, I mean, Jonathan seems spot on in terms of in terms of where we're headed. Uh, the complexity here uh, makes me hope and certainly the car manufacturers uh, see the benefits here uh, that that these kinds of questions will be well thought through. Uh, but I'll tell you, based upon that schematic, which was quite something, uh, we have, it seems like we have a lot of steps to take uh, before 2016 when we can start seeing these cars on the road. Right. And of course, the one thing, you know, no matter how your communications and entertainment um, are integrated into your car, the one thing that cars will always know and, and today and in future will uh, log 
quite effectively is where you've been and where you're, you know, all of your location data. Uh, and obviously that can be quite relevant in uh, criminal and other legal proceedings. So um, it's, it's clearly something that um, I think the automakers are paying attention to and for uh, public relations or other purposes are trying to get out in front of. Uh, Anne-Marie, can you think of any other reasons why uh, we'd want our cars to have good privacy protection? I can think of all kinds of reasons why we want our yep. cars to have good privacy protections. I mean, I think this mm -hmm. whole issue really highlights uh, what is, I think, a yawning need for uh, reform of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act uh, and for a comprehensive federal privacy statute. I rented a car last weekend, and as I was sort of clicking through the adhesion contract uh, so that I could get to the point where I could actually get the keys to the car, one of the provisions was that uh, there was technology embedded in the car that would allow Dollar to uh, track where I had gone. Uh, and in order to rent the car, I had to consent to that tracking. And I just was outraged by that. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is this is going on now. Um, I think that, you know, there we just really I think, you know, the FTC has been operating in this space with regard to these codes of conduct and these published privacy policies, for example, that online behavioral advertisers have. Um, I think Jonathan suggests that the situation with car manufacturers is moving in the same direction where they will just uh, adopt this voluntary code of best practices uh, and then they will, you know, only be responsible to the law you know, to the extent that they breach those practices in a way that the FTC can then assert uh, some jurisdiction over. But I think Congress really needs to, to step up. Um, it's time for this kind of reform. You know, the technologies are just getting more and more invasive. They are getting cheaper and cheaper. And I think people are getting more and more concerned about this. And um, yeah. I hesitate to say that Congress should do anything because it doesn't seem to be able to do much of anything. But I think if it does anything, it should it should do ECPA reform. It's time. I'm guessing you rented the car, though. I did rent the car. What else was I going to do? It was terrible. Yeah. Yeah. It's a terrible bind. Right. So, so what sad situation do we find ourselves in? We have a very brilliant law professor who has actually read the terms, found the outrageous provision in there, and still feels like she has to sign off on it to rent the car. <laughs> and you teach I, contracts, too. I know. If, it, if, really if, irked, it, it really yeah. irked the guy at the dollar rent-a-car counter that I was actually bothering to read through the screens. He was uh, definitely <laughs> not happy about that. Just wanted to know what I was agreeing to. It's a legitimate thing. Right. Uh, someone was interjecting there. Anyone have a comment? I was going to ask Emery where she went, but I figured that's probably also a private <laughs> issue. Well, it's just doll dollar. Yes, dollar rent a car. Right. Dollar will tell you where I went. Everywhere I went. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, speaking of uh, being able to mess around with things like contracts and uh, computers and coffee machines, I suppose maybe we better look at some copyright issues. So I've been struck lately by uh, the prevalence of articles covering things like DRM and circumventing DRM and uh, the DMCA in general. And I, I think that these things might be bubbling up to our consciousness these days because we're um, in the process, uh, people like EFF and others are in the process of suggesting exemptions, applying for exemptions to the operations of the DMCA. Uh, the Copyright Office decides every three years uh, what sort of ways in which you can circumvent uh, various encryption technologies in order to access or use your devices uh, in ways that would otherwise be barred by the DMCA. So we're in, in the throes of that process, and I, I think that may be contributing to um, a number of these stories. But uh, these come up from time to time. People probably remember um, lawsuits about printers and making compatible printer cartridges. We've covered the Keurig coffee mach maker uh, problem on the show before um, and whether Keurig is going to allow um, non-licensed 
K cups to be used in its machines. Um, their response has not exactly been um, garnering a whole lot of consumer support, and it, that there are whole sites dedicated to hacking Keurigs. Uh, and I thought uh, we'd go ahead and uh, give you um, some evidence of how that can be done. Uh, there's a great video that uh, will show you exactly how you can go ahead and uh, well, this isn't exactly circumventing copy protection. It's a little bit less sophisticated than that, but we'll go ahead and show you what, what you can do. All right, so Zach, jump ahead. There we go. Yes, it involves tape. So there we go. Achievement unlocked. Non-compliant Keurig. Defeated by some tape. <laughs> <laughs> or the Keurig protection device tape. All right. So um, thank you so much uh, for bearing with us as uh, we show that to you. Um, I, I thought it was pretty funny. And uh, I do think that um, it shows how people do not have a whole lot of patience with being told, you know, we can only um, use our licensed uh, coffee cups or printer cartridges or, you know, you may not access certain parts of your car. People are going to work around that, aren't they, Anne-Marie? They are going to work around it and they should work around it, right? Because, the, you know, DRM, the... the Anti-circumvention provisions in the DMCA are really intended to uh, prevent copyright infringement, right? And to prevent the breaking of encryption that protects copyrighted works. But the question in these kinds of cases, you know, it, the DRM isn't being used to protect copyrighted code from being copied. It's basically being used to prevent third party manufacturers from making interoperable aftermarket parts, right? Or consumables, as you said, the, the printer cases, uh, are, are on point here. You know, and courts have said in these cases that customers really have paid for the right to access the software that controls the devices they own. Um, and so, you know, we care about circumvention when circumvention is being done to facilitate infringement. We don't care or shouldn't care, and the law shouldn't care about circumvention uh, when it's being done to help you have uh, a cup of coffee from, you know, a vendor who's not going to charge you as much uh, for a K-cup as Keurig will. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think we need to remember the purpose for which Section 1201 was enacted, uh, and it wasn't enacted to give uh, these manufacturers control over aftermarkets. It's just not what it was for. We had uh, a positive development along these lines uh, from a federal judge in New York. Uh, this, um, I think, related to uh, the Apple ebook antitrust litigation. Um, and parties that have come after Apple because of its ebook strategies. This was called a Abbey House Media versus Apple. And uh, Abbey House Media on its page um, pointed users to a free program that they could use uh, to remove DRM from their downloaded ebooks in order to have them uh, available should they change reading devices, et cetera. And the judge in that case, uh, the, the, uh, I'm not sure if this was a claim or a counterclaim. Um, I think that was probably a counterclaim by Apple against Abbey House that, ooh, you know, they should be liable because they're telling people how to break our DRM. The judge in that case uh, found no, that, that that was not inducing infringement, that there was no um, allegation that 
uh, Abbey House or its users had engaged in infringing acts or that Abbey House had encouraged them. So simply pointing to um, DRM defeating technologies, as we just did in showing you that video, arguably, um, would not be um, a problem per this judge in New York. I take it you think this was the right outcome, Anne-Marie? I think this was the right outcome. Um, you know, the, the other thing the court said in that case is there was no proof that there was any underlying direct infringement because the people who were being instructed on where to go to find circumvention tools were people who had lawfully purchased those eBooks and who are going to lose access to them, I think, because Abbey House went out of business and was taking its DRM servers down. I don't know exactly what the factual details were around it. You know, but these were people who are going to lose access to works that they uh, had already purchased. Um, and Abbey House was simply saying to them, you know, here is how you can strip the DRM away so you can port these books to other devices. And so not only did the court say that that's, you know, not a facilitation of infringement, you know, they said there's no there's no direct infringement that was being facilitated here uh, by Abbey House, and so I think it was a, a good it was a good decision on both of those fronts that there was no underlying infringement by the users, and that Abbey House did nothing wrong. So among other things that are being requested uh, in the current exemption process, EFF is working on one uh, that would exempt people tinkering with their cars uh, from being subject to uh, DMCA circumvention liability. There's a good list over at the EFF site that I'll point you guys toward. It's uh, a little too long to read on the air here, but it's uh, if you Google EFF and 2015 DMCA rulemaking, you'll find it. And it's in our discussion points on Delicious, uh, where they're tracking not only um, the exemptions that they are responsible for uh, requesting, but others as well. Um, Dave, have you heard of any other notable ones that are in the offing? There's one There's one that, uh, that I'm a bit familiar with, which is interesting. It's on the research side of the equation. Um, a number of uh, engineers um have have proposed uh, a sim an exemption for uh, security researchers uh, you know the need for security researchers to have access to uh, the systems that they are researching to determine vulnerabilities raises the very uh, DMCA uh, technological protection measure uh, issues that uh, the previous case alluded to. So I know that that uh, was was a, a proposal that was put in uh, to allow security researchers uh, the ability to do their research and have access without running afoul of uh, the TPM provisions. One of the you know one of the one of the interesting wrinkles here, uh, in my mind, uh, and I and I agree with Anne Marie that that the, the holding uh, there was the right one is the difference between. Uh, circumventing technological protection measures and distributing devices uh, that uh, circumvent technological protection measures. And a lot of the concern, uh, I think, coming from the copyright industry ultimately boils down to that second issue. Uh, you know, individual access is one thing, but the dissemination of devices that circumvent is another. And from a policy and, and practical standpoint, it seems to me a lot of those exemptions uh, have a much better chance, assuming they any of them have a chance to be clear, a lot of those proposals have a better chance when they narrow uh, the scope of what it is they're trying to uh, get around. Uh, the other thing I wanted to note was, you know, the, the, this issue of, 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 of contributory infringement and, uh, you know, who is actually liable uh, is one that, you know, comes up, you know, pretty regularly where courts are trying to figure out what exactly inducement is. Uh, and, you know, to the extent that courts narrowly uh, construe uh, the statute uh, to hold that inducement is inducing literally copyright infringement uh, and not something related to it, uh, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I put this in for you, Anne-Marie, because uh, this is someone else who uh, reads contracts in terms of service. Sebastian Page at the iDownload blog uh, found some entertaining language in uh, the iOS terms of service uh, regarding jailbreaking, which is legal in the United States now. 
Uh, but Apple still really, really doesn't want you to do it, really doesn't want you to do it. And they've phrased it that way in their documentation. Uh, they, what they say exactly is making unauthorized modifications to the software on an iPhone violates the iPhone software license agreement. The common term for modifying an iPhone is jailbreaking with a particular emphasis on the second part of that term. That's why we strongly, almost emphatically recommend that you do not do so. Really, um, so just some interesting draftsmanship there, and and also I guess the issue contractually, uh, and and whether this is a good thing or not, uh, of, of the fact that it's legal in the U.S. But still, if you go ahead and do it, you're going to be violating uh, your license agreement, and Apple's going to try not to service that phone uh, as much as possible. Um, do you see a problem there, Anne Marie? I do. I mean, I think it's a, you know, the, the tension between what copyright law permits and what terms of service permit is a pretty, uh, it goes back for many years now. I mean, you have questions about uh, first sale doctrine and whether terms of service can, you know, prevent you from selling media that you have bought uh, and that you have a right under the Copyright Act to resell if you want to. Um, you know, we live in a country where you can, you know, give up your constitutional rights uh, in a contract. And so it seems a little strange to think that you wouldn't be able to sort of, uh, you know, waive your right to jailbreak in a, in a contract. But I do think that, you know, it's, it's problematic when you have these mass sort of contracts of adhesion that all consumers have to sign uh, where they are asked to give up rights that they affirmatively have under law. Um, and so I, you know, I don't know exactly what to say about that other than it seems, you know, problematic that, uh, you know, that, that the law gives you something, public law gives you something that then private law takes away. Um, but that, you, you know, that has been the way of things with copyright for, for some time. You mentioned earlier, I think that that might be the province of the FTC to step in and say that that's actually not okay to do. Although they well, haven't done no, that. No, I mean, it's, they haven't done that, and I don't think they will, because it's not as mm -hmm. if Apple is, is engaging in some kind of deceptive trade practice, right? They're not, mm -hmm. they're not publishing some policy that they then turn around and violate. I mean, all they're doing is they're using their power, you know, um, as, the, as the seller of that device to sort of set the terms under which you, you get the warranty. And so if you're willing to give up the warranty, you can certainly go ahead and exercise your right to jailbreak the phone. And that's a cost that Apple is permitted to impose on its buyers. This is one reason I don't buy any Apple products. All right. Uh, well, let's uh, look at a moment at, uh, at the aftermath of the hack that Sony was involved in, uh, but not until we get to our second sponsor of this episode of This Week in Law, which is Blue Apron. Uh, we've talked a lot about Blue Apron on the show lately. I'm so glad that we get to do so again right before the holidays because I really want you to um, put this on your list, both for your own holiday entertaining. It's going to make that so much easier and a really a wonderful way to share deliciousness and uh, easy gourmet cooking uh, with your friends during the holiday as well. Cooking and eating should be fun, but if you're busy or health conscious or just don't know your way around a kitchen, it can be a chore. I know this. I love to cook, but frequently don't have the time to go through all the steps that are involved in making a really wonderful meal. Ordering out is expensive and it gets unhealthy pretty fast. And who knows how long that food in the grocery store has been sitting around on the shelves or how far it's had to travel. But you can forget all that because you need Blue Apron to make cooking uh, fresh, delicious meals easy. Here's how it works. You pay $9.99 per person per meal. Blue Apron then sends you a refrigerated box with the right high quality ingredients in exactly the right proportions and simple step-by-step -step recipe instructions. And this all comes right to your door. These ingredients come from local farms, so you'll be getting produce that is currently in season and at the peak of its freshness. Meals are only 500 to 700 calories per serving, though you'd never guess it given how delicious they are. They work around your schedule and your dietary preferences. Cooking takes about half an hour. Shipping is always free and the menu is always featuring new recipes. They'll never send, send you the same meal twice. You'll make meals like salmon with quick preserved lemon, quinoa curly kale, 
Uh, or you could try cabbage and charred stir fried rice with sweet potatoes and shiitake mushrooms. You'll cook these and many, many more incredible meals and be blown away by the quality and freshness. Blue Apron is fast, fresh, and super affordable. You're going to cook like a gourmet chef. I know you might be skeptical about that, but I've made plenty of these meals now and they're really wonderful and really quite easy. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna see what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals for free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's right, two meals just for going to blueapron.com slash twit. Thank you so much, Blue Apron, for the delicious food, the wonderful holiday help, and your support of This Week in Law. All right, uh, let's go take a quick look at Hollywood before we get out of here. So I think by now most people know that Sony was hacked. I saw it even came up uh, in James Franco's monologue, I think, when he recently hosted Saturday Night Live. So um, it's it's out there in the public consciousness. But Jonathan, uh, are, is Sony now trying to hack the hackers? What's going on there? So there's a lot of ambiguity around this. It got, it got kicked off by some reporting by Recode that was uh, pretty ambiguous. Uh, so. The, the article talked about how Sony w had launched a distributed denial of service attack against folks who were hosting um, the stolen files. Uh, but the details of the article seemed to not really be a, a DDoS attack, but rather um, a, an approach to slow down downloads by spoofing uh, folks in BitTorrent swarms who had these, these files, but not actually uh, having the files. Um, that raises uh, a, a much lesser set of, of legal concerns and I think a much lesser set of policy concerns. Um, pretending you have some stolen files you don't have just is not the same as knocking down folks uh, who happen to have the stolen files. Yeah, absolutely. But did, will the law, do you think, recognize that fine-grained distinction? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think um, the, the provision most on point for denial of service attack, it, uh, attack is a, a portion of the, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, mm -hmm. to be precise, uh, 1030A5A, uh, which deals with uh, intentionally damaging computer systems. Um, I think it's hard to get to that sort of intentional damage uh, out of uh, claiming you have something and not having it. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of a case that's gone that way. So, some courts have certainly stretched that provision, uh, but the, the most common use now seems to be around denial of service uh, attacks. Um, and so I, I, th I think uh, that would be very clearly covered. I don't think uh, uh, claiming something, again, I, I, I'm not aware of a case quite like that. Okay. Uh, before we uh, go ahead and leave our entertainment-related stories, I guess uh, a moment of silence for uh, the Pirate Bay would be in order since they have been raided again and uh, don't seem to be um, something that's going to have a viable future, at least for the immediate time being. Uh, any thoughts on Pirate Bay going down, Dave? Yeah, you know, this is, you know, it's it, it, it's it's an amazing, uh, you know, history uh, and short history of of what happens when I'm just looking at the article again. You know, what happens when uh, you've, you've got groups of individuals uh, who, you know, are, are are gathered around a particular activity that causes a lot of high profile problems. And and when you hold up a lightning rod, uh, you get hit. I mean, it, it, my, my my profound insight uh, here uh, is, you know, all of the efforts that, as the article points out, uh, to to prevent uh, Pirate Bay from getting taken down. Uh, don't work very well. And of course, this is something, again, that, you know, Jonathan knows well, and, you know, my, my own work on trade secrecy, you know, when I've talked to cybersecurity experts, and I've said to them, you know, look, uh, you know, if if you have a, a bottomless uh, pit of resources, if, if you're Boeing, and you can put all the money uh, and, and, and tons of people into uh, securing your network, what is our technological capability? And, and, and the response uh, is, you know, Often, uh, well, we can detect intruders, um, but we can't really prevent them from going in. And so in a broad sense, 
uh, you know, the efforts to attempt to uh, create uh, networks that allow for this activity to go forward uh, never uh, seem to uh, work as well as those that want to stop that behavior from happening. And this has been, you know, the, the history of, of copyright infringement on the Internet as well. I also wanted to note, uh, by the way, quickly uh, with regard to the, uh, you know, previous story um, mm -hmm. and the CFAA, you know, recognize that the, C the, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which, of course, has gotten a lot of got a lot of attention after the tragedy surrounding the death of Aaron Swartz, you know, is in dire need of reform. And uh, not to circle back and hijack for the last few minutes uh, to go back to trade secrecy, but one of the primary uh, goals that 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 we have in terms of opposing those bills is to suggest that the solution to these problems of, of cyber espionage and computer security is not at all trade secret law, but it's to fix the CFAA. Um, and so th th those issues tend to recur. That's a wonderful segue because uh, we have something about the CFAA in our uh, resource section when we get to our tip and resources of the week. Before we go there, I just uh, I promised I would try and give you guys some fodder for your upcoming exams and that uh, Keurig hacking YouTube video. Of course, the IRC chat room all picked up on the Darth Vader music in the background, but none of us mentioned it. So uh, just, just mull on that. When one is making um, a video that tells you how to... Uh, alter a non-licensed Keurig into working with the Keurig machine and one inserts into it uh, presumably non-licensed <laughs> Star Wars soundtrack music in the background, you know, discuss on your copyright <laughs> exam. Are, are you ready to put that one into practice, Anne-Marie? I think that's a fair use parody. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right, let's you know, that, uh, get... That's also, Denise, can I say one last thing on that one? Of course. Uh, yeah, just very quickly, you know, and, and again, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm dating myself endlessly with all these references to old technologies and, and laws, but, and I'm going to really date myself now, but for those of you that remember the five and a quarter inch floppy disk uh, that was so useful in the 80s, one way to do a Keurig-like hack of the, of those disks, which could only be recorded on on one side based upon, very similar to Keurig, a little uh, slit that was on the side of it was to get a hole puncher and punch a similar hole on the other side of the disk to allow you to record on the other side. Um, and so this tried and true method of using tape and basic uh, home craft uh, aids uh, in solving issues involving locking down technology uh, is one that has a very rich history. So it brought back a happy memory for me um, in hacking all of my disks to make them twice as valuable. Sounds like we need a book cataloging those sorts of instances, Dave. You can put that on your plate. <laughs> All right, um, our, our tip of the week is that if you're not already licensing things under Creative Commons, you should start doing it because in 2015, someone is going to license the billionth Creative Commons licensed work. So it could be you. So that's my tip is if you're not already using the Creative Commons licenses in the things that you create, do it. And you could be the billionth user, I'm sure, uh, balloons and things will fall from the sky if it does wind up being you. Uh, we have a couple of great resources for you this week. Um, as promised a moment ago, a great primer on the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act from Kim Zetter at Wired. Uh, she says this federal anti-hacking statute pro prohibits unauthorized access to computers and networks and was enacted to expand existing criminal laws to address a growing concern about computer crimes. But lawmakers wrote the law so poorly that creative prosecutors have been abusing it ever since. And uh, we've had lots of instances of that that we've discussed on the show. Um, any further thoughts on the CFAA, Jonathan? Uh, sure. So I've, I've actually um, uh, done some research of my own on the statute. Um, mm -hmm. and a forthcoming paper did some empirical work on understanding how CFAA gets used. Um, it turns out not only is there some potential for abuse in the sense of the sorts of fact patterns that um, uh, you, you might not want to have under the statute, not only is that that potential, that's actually... Uh, uh, on, the, on the civil side, the, the most common set of fact patterns are the employer-employee disputes, the um, uh, competitor disputes, where there really isn't technical sophistication. It looks a lot like trade secret uh, type litigation, uh, but it gets brought as hacking claims. Um, on the law enforcement side, 
Uh, most cases appear to be um, the sorts of things we would consider conventional hacking, some sort of technical sophistication, circumventing some sort of technical protection. Um, uh, but there's still an awful lot of cases that don't involve that. And uh, somewhat am amusingly, in a sense, uh, one of the most common fact patterns is law enforcement officers who have access to some uh, proprietary database and uh, use that uh, access uh, in ways that uh, their, their department prohibits by policy or, or just exceeds the scope of their job. Um, strangest case, hands down, just to close with a, a goofy, goofy in a sense, anecdote. Uh, strangest case, hands down, was a, I kid you not, a cannibalism conspiracy in New York, um, where one of the participants was a New York police detective uh, who was researching uh, uh, allegedly potential victims using department resources. Um, he ultimately didn't get convicted of the cannibalism issue, uh, but did get convicted under CFAA because he accessed department resources in violation of policy. Uh, delicious <laughs> is all I can say. Yes, that's an odd way for uh, the CFAA to come up and be applied. Uh, we have one more resource for you in keeping with the holidays. I figure um, you will want to know about this for two reasons. Number one, people listening to the show uh, might know other people for whom this would be a great gift. Uh, and all of us uh, hopefully will have some free time coming up over the holidays. And on my reading list, uh, is the new audio book uh, put out by Corey Doctor Doctorow of his book, Information Doesn't Want to Be Free, Laws for the Internet Age. He's independently produced it. Will Re Wheaton reads the whole thing. There are forwards by Neil Gaiman and Amanda Palmer. It's $15. It's DRM free. It has no EULA, so you won't have to read the fine print. And I'm sure it's delightful. I'm looking forward to it. Um, experiencing the whole thing. You, you put Cory Doctorow, Will Wheaton, Neil Gaiman, and internet laws together in one package for me and put it under the Christmas tree and I am one happy, happy gal. So um, hopefully that will be the case for uh, others who listen to the show. Uh, this has been such a great panel. I've really enjoyed picking your brains about all the important issues we've discussed today. Dave, always great to have you back on the show. Uh, terrific, Denise. Thanks so much. I always enjoy chatting with you, and I'm a big fan uh, of This Week in Law. So thanks for having me back again. Well, we're big fans of you. So um, thanks so much. We really, really appreciate your time and your thoughts. And the same goes for you, Anne-Marie Bridey. Uh, so great to meet you over Skype and uh, to have had the chance to chat with you on the show. It was fun. Let's do it again. Yeah, definitely. Stay warm up there in northern Idaho. And uh, Jonathan, you do the same up in the Bay Area. Thanks. And it looks like the rain just stopped. Oh, yeah, that's because we got it down here in Southern California. <laughs> it's deluging outside here today, but I know you guys just went through that as well. It's so funny to me how in California everything shuts down because of a bit of rain. Uh, we actually had school closures for rain up in Northern California, I understand it. So um, it, definitely we need it, but uh, it's been throwing everything into a tailspin. Jonathan, great chatting with you. Um, so fun learning about your work at Stanford. Uh, anything else on your plate that you wanna let people know about before we get out, and out of here? Uh, well, let's see. Um, uh uh, we have some uh, upcoming survey results on the third party doctrine that might be of interest. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is this, this doctrine that exempts metadata from constitutional protection. Uh, and the notion is folks knowingly give up this information and therefore they waive their privacy interests. And so it seemed to us worth, worth asking some ordinary folks, okay, what do you think you know you give up? Uh, and so uh, we should have some answers on that soon. Uh, and we're already pretty surprised by what we're finding. Uh, some, some pretty nuanced distinctions, for example, uh, between um, uh, uh, cell phone location uh, when someone's using their phone versus when they're not using their phone uh, might be constitutionally salient. Um, at any rate, stay tuned. Yeah, that does sound really interesting. Keep us posted on that if you would. Uh, Anne-Marie, anything going on uh, in your studies or at your school that you want to let people know about? Uh, in April, we have the Idaho Law Review Symposium uh, called Privacy in the Age of Pervasive Surveillance. Our keynote speaker is going to be David Medine, Chairman of the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. Uh, we're going to be live streaming that. It will be uh, in Boise 
Um, Ed Felton of CITP will be there, Chris Segoyan, uh, really a wonderful lineup of people who are doing important work in privacy and surveillance and uh, cybersecurity. Oh, I'm so glad we got to bring up Ed Felton on this show because we've been talking much about the freedom to tinker. And uh, he's been writing at that blog for a long time. Uh, Dave, how about you? Anything going on at Elon or with you? Uh, yeah, so uh, Sharon and I will have a, a longer piece on trade secret reform uh, coming out, <coughs> excuse me, in Washington and Lee's uh, online law review. Uh, that'll be out in January. We're excited about that. Um, I'm also going to have a piece uh, trying to uh, figure out a meaningful way to allow for public access to international trade agreements, given what T TTIP is doing. Uh, that'll be out in the spring as well. Uh, and and other other than that, those are the immediate things. Uh, more long term is is looking at how uh, trade secret law can be tailored by industry and how we think about information flows. Um, so so uh, you know quite a, quite a bit of writing and sitting in front of of uh, computers, but uh, all towards a uh, good end in the coming uh, few months. All right. Well, this has been a really wide ranging and fun show. I'm so glad you've all been able to join us. Uh, if you've been doing so at Friday on Friday at 11 o'clock Pacific time, 1900 UTC, then you've been joining us live and we really appreciate that. That's when we record the shows. However, uh, don't worry if you can't catch it live. We're going to be available for you on demand, however you'd like. Uh, we've got a YouTube channel at uh, youtube.com slash thisweekinlaw. Uh, we've got our show page, of course, uh, at twit.tv slash thisweekinlaw, where you can find our whole archive of shows. We're on Roku. Uh, we're in iTunes, uh, various ways that you like to consume your netcast entertainment. We're going to be right there for you if you check our show page uh, you'll see that there are many, many different ways to access the show. And we encourage you to do it in the way that makes the most sense for you. You're, we're just happy to have you along for the ride. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm D Howell over there. That's a great way to reach out to me between shows. Send me links and ideas. Uh, if you have something a little more confidential you'd like to share, I do have email. I'm Denise at twit.tv. You can use that. Or if you just need some more room, head on over to Google, Google Plus or Facebook uh, where we have show pages as well. Uh, those are great ways to reach out. Uh, give us your feedback on this show or any others. Give us guest suggestions, topic suggestions. We uh, love to hear from you. There's obviously no, no way. These are huge topics that we follow here on This Week in Law. There's no way to know everything about them or what's going on in all of these areas. So we really rely on you, our audience members, to um, keep us posted what's going on and what hits your radar that looks important. So really appreciate your help with that. We appreciate your joining us today and we'll see you next week on This Week in Law.